Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Naked Imperialism, the U.S. Pursuit of Global Dominance by John Bellamy Foster, Monthly Review Press, 2006. The key idea of this text is that imperialist warfare is the dominant political force of the 21st century. This is because, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the loss of a major oppositional force to U.S. imperialism, the U.S. has moved from subtle imperialism into blatant, full-on, but naked imperialism. <laughs> Okay, obligatory naked joke out of the way. Foster warns that the imperialistic center of the first world, in its ever-increasing exploitation of the periphery third world, is spreading barbarism that will soon take the entire world into its fold, like some kind of big, some kind of big giant, uh, like when Homeworld wanted to convert Earth into a gem colony. What was the plan? Well, let's take a look. Ta-da! A finished Earth colony. Yeah, this plan stinks! Completing this colony would have meant the extinction of all life on Earth. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Introduction. To start, Foster defines imperialism, stating, The objective of the imperialist system of today, as in the past, is to open up peripheral economies to investment from the core capitalist countries thus ensuring both a continual supply of raw materials at low prices and a net outflow of economic surplus from the periphery to the center of the world system. This is essentially a modern rewrite of the famous Woodrow Wilson quote, Since trade ignores national boundaries and the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of his nation must follow him, and the doors of the nations which are closed against him must be battered down, etc., etc. Foster then introduces the two main claims of the text. One, it was the collapse of the Soviet bloc in 1989 that represented the real sea change for U.S. imperialism. And two, the course on which the U.S. and world capitalism is now headed points to global barbarism, or worse. Chapter 1, After the Attack, The War on Terrorism. This chapter is about media distortion of 9-11, and the U.S. Empire's need for terrorism to be the new boogeyman to justify U.S. interventionism now that the Soviet Union is gone. Looking at the broader contradictions of imperialism as a whole, Foster states, A core tension in capitalist societies, hampered by universal adult suffrage, is how to reconcile inegalitarian economies with formerly egalitarian politics. The mass of the population must be persuaded to subsidize the expense of empire though its benefits are hard to locate. And, when the inevitable war comes, the masses must be convinced to fight and die for the empire, as the How Did My Freedoms Get Over There meme demonstrates. Chapter 2, Imperialism and Empire. This chapter critiques the view that the U.S. is a peaceful empire and part of a unifying global force. People often point to independence movements and the lack of direct colonialism as proof that imperialism is behind us, to this, Foster argues, the claim that today's imperialism, represented above all by the United States, is somehow lessened by the fact that there is little direct political rule of foreign territories, simply fails to understand the problems facing us. The U.S. currently occupies foreign territory in the form of military bases in some 60 countries. This number has gone to over 70 countries since the book was published. In fact, I recommend making a lovely little map like this one for yourself. Mine is in the bathroom. It's a great conversation starter. So what is Foster's solution to this? He states, What remaining hope there is for humanity under these circumstances lies with the rebuilding of socialism, and more immediately with the emergence of a popular struggle centered within the United States to prevent Washington from continuing its deadly game of Samson in the Temple of Humanity. Chapter 3, Monopoly Capital and the New Globalization. This chapter looks at several theories from Marx to today to see how Marxism has changed to incorporate global corporations into its theories since 
global corporations don't face competition of consumer and producer in the traditional capitalist sense. Instead, global corporations use the consumption of the global north and the production of the global south to incur huge profits without competition. To this, Foster again warns, more than ever before, a world of globalized monopoly capital and hegemonic imperialism led by the United States presents us with a stark choice between deadly barbarism or a humane socialism. Which might sound scary to you civilized folks, the desperate poverty of capitalist third world conditions spread over the entire globe, but I'm not too worried. I got plenty of survival instincts. Forging for sticks, chasing sticks, destroying sticks, you name it. Chapter 4, U.S. Bases and Empire. This chapter analyzes the expanse of U.S. bases around the world in the absence of direct colonialism. To start with, Foster provides a map of U.S. foreign bases. Maps like this are handy. Again, I recommend making one of your own. Anyway, Foster argues, there can be little doubt that attacks over the last decade or more directed against both U.S. forces abroad and targets in the United States itself have been a response in large part to the growing U.S. role as a foreign military power. The perception of U.S. military bases as intrusions on national sovereignty is widespread in host countries. Following this, Foster names several problems U.S. bases bring to host countries. Soldiers committing sexual assault, and pollution caused by weapon testing, among other things. The next few chapters look at modern pundits using the word imperialism to refer to the U.S. in a positive way. And Foster argues, There are rules, however, to this re-engagement with the concepts of empire and imperialism within establishment discourse. The uniquely benevolent motives of the United States must be emphasized. Then Foster examines the changes that took place in U.S. imperialism following the collapse of the Soviet Union, namely the U.S. move to control global oil production in the Middle East and U.S. imperialism maintaining the U.S.'s role as the sole superpower. Next, Foster discusses neo-imperialism and addresses regime change and how it is achieved and how it is necessary for informal colonialism. And Foster demonstrates that American imperialism is bipartisan, and Foster looks at Clinton and Bush's foreign policies. And today it's no different. Look at the transition from Obama to Trump, and U.S. foreign policy is virtually unchanged. Chapter 10. Is Iraq another Vietnam? This chapter explains that both wars were long, costly, needed increased numbers of troops, and that the general population of the invaded country was considered an enemy who could not be trusted with self-governance. See the shock doctrine on Iraq and democracy. However, Vietnam did have some support within the country and had the legitimacy of the Cold War, and Iraq lacks these benefits. And Foster concludes, any outcome that does not lead to continuing US control by a combination of economic, political, and military means of the Iraq oil reserves will be deemed a failure by U.S. capitalism. And of course, as we see, Iraq is deemed a failed state. Chapter 11. The U.S. Empire, Pax Americana or Pax Americana. This chapter explains that as it becomes obvious that the U.S. is an empire, elites try to display it as benevolent, but the brutal reality is being exposed. Chapter 12, Empire of Barbarism. Foster again looks at Marxist theories from classic imperialism to today and demonstrates that imperialism is barbarian with its use of slavery, exploitation, deindustrialization, and torture. Foster uses several quotes from Marx on how the toil of workers under capitalism is a return to slavery, a return to barbarism, and that it is a disease. But can this be maintained? Foster warns. The continued decline of U.S. economic hegemony, occurring alongside deepening economic stagnation in capitalism as a whole, has led the United States to turn increasingly to extra-economic means of maintaining its position, putting its huge war machine in motion in order to prop up its flattering hegemony over the world economy. And finally, Chapter 13, The Failure of Empire. This chapter argues that U.S. imperialism bit off more than it could chew in Iraq, and speculates what should be done and what will happen next. Here, Foster solidifies his argument about the fall of the Soviet Union as a turning point for U.S. imperialism, and states, With the fall of the Soviet bloc, and the demise two years later of the Soviet Union itself, the United States moved to fill the vacuum of world power, carrying out military interventions in the Middle East, 
the Horn of Africa, and the former Yugoslavia that would have previously been unthinkable. Following the attacks of September 2001, the U.S. invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq, and the construction of military bases in former Soviet republics of Central Asia, constituted a vast expansion of the American Empire into hitherto inaccessible regions. From here, Foster makes predictions of the future. Now, this was published in 2006. Let's see how these predictions held up. He states, Iraqi opposition to the American liberators will only grow. Meanwhile, any Iraqi government that is elected under these circumstances will either have to be opposed to the U.S. occupation or lose any claims of legitimacy within Iraqi society. Foster continues, Wider speculation at this point will be foolhardy. But there is no doubt that in invading Iraq, the United States opened the doors of hell, not only for Iraqis and the Middle East as a whole, but also for its own global imperialist order. The full repercussions of the failure of the U.S. empire in Iraq have yet to be seen, and will only become evident in the months and years ahead. And well, over the last 12 years since the text was published, how have things developed? Well. After the text, there was the Iraqi Civil War in 2006, and of course the surge of U.S. troops sent in in 2007, the disaster capitalist subcontractor private security contractor loop that the Shock Doctrine explored, the Arab Spring of 2010, which reached Iraq in 2011, which saw many countries in the Middle East and North Africa have political uprisings which led to the overthrow of their governments, and Syria collapsing into civil war, and ISIS spreading from Iraq to Syria and elsewhere. And in 2017, the U.S. bombed Iraq, which killed hundreds of civilians. And now we see the U.S. and England engaged in bombing Syria, while at the same time not accepting Syrian refugees. So we can clearly see Foster's predictions came true. Conclusion this text frames imperialism in regards to Marxist theories of imperialism and the struggle between the center and the periphery, the first world versus the third world. Foster explores the blatant expansion of U.S. imperialist action following the fall of the Soviet Union and the loss of a countervailing force to U.S. imperialism. This text is a little more accessible than something like William Bloom's Killing Hope or Ward Churchill's On the Justice of Roosting Chickens or other foreign policy texts that flood the reader with detailed explanations of several specific U.S. interventions. At under 200 pages, this text is helpful for a brief overview of the transition in methods of imperialism in the post-Cold War era and into the future. Foster calls upon us to challenge U.S. naked imperialism and bring about its end, or risk collapse, into global barbarism. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with a radical reviewer. Thanks for watching.